and I'm delighted to introduce Sandra, someone I've known for maybe a couple of years, I guess, uh, more from the American side than, than here, so it's lovely that Sandra has uh, been able to take time to, to be with us, so um, thank you, uh, Sandra. You, um, you may well have given feedback sheets already, which is lovely. If you haven't, I would ask you to, to uh, provide those feedback sheets. Uh, that they mean a great deal uh, in terms of planning next year. Uh, so please do that. That would be really helpful. Um, so Sandra, Sandra is the uh, speaker for the next uh, period of time, at least till the close. And I'm delighted that on colostrum management, um, Sandra s spoke uh, to a group in America. And in a way, that was the catalyst to ask Sandra to be with us uh, this week. Um, so colostrum management, uh, getting uh, the calves off to a great start is, is the title. But uh, please do ask questions. I think, Sandra, you're pretty happy with that arrangement, if that's all right. But uh, you're very welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Can everyone hear me at the back OK? Great. And I just want to thank Michael and the organizing committee one more time for the opportunity to be here. It's been a wonderful experience. All right, so um, I've, I've been here for the week. I've been talking on a variety of mostly calf-related topics, uh, housing, nutrition, and, and the like. And you've heard Mike Van Amberg hopefully do his thing on nutrition, which is incredibly important. Another uh, cornerstone of the calf management program is colostrum, so that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. And I realize I am holding, I am standing between you and lunch, probably. But as Michael said, if, if there are questions that come up, I'm, I mean, as long as you don't get totally fed up and too late, too hungry. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions as we go or, or comments. All right, so I just want to take us back to the, the goals, setting goals for our programs, whether that's milk production or nutrition of the lactating herd or our young stock program. I think we always need to start with our goals and then work backwards as to how we are going to achieve those goals and come up with reasonable plans to get there. And so. Everyone can set their own goals, everyone should set their own goals, but to me this is, a, this is kind of a very big encompassing statement here, probably too many words on the slide, but in an efficient manner, economical manner, produce a quality replacement heifer that has the genetics, the size, the health, the immune function, the body condition, uh, and management background, and that goes to housing and nutritional management, close-up feeding, et cetera so that we can breed her at 13 to 15 months of age, so that she can calve in at 22 to 24 months of age with uh, a nice frame, minimal calving difficulties, minimal metabolic disease or postpartum problems, so that she can go on and have a healthy start, make a lot of milk for us and, and for the producer. And so this is the, this is the goal. And the 22 to 24 months of age, I know people can argue if they want a little older, but this has been proven or, or worked out um, in multiple studies as to be the optimal lifetime production or lifetime performance of an animal if we can get her to calve in. But of course, we can't calve her in too small or we're asking for trouble. So we need to grow her right, prepare her correctly so that she's ready. Um, backing up to the calf then, we're going to talk about pre-wean calves now. How are we going to get to that goal? Um, being a veterinarian, one of the biases, you know, I obviously have to talk about disease, although I think nu disease prevention is important. Yes, nutritional management is equally, if not more important. Um, in the U.S., if we look to the calf hood disease frequency, <coughs> if we look at mortality rates in the pre-weaning period, um, somewhere between 8 and 11 percent of live-born calves will die prior to weaning. So that doesn't even include the stillbirths, which is yet another problem that we need to address as an industry. But this is USDA data, this is nationwide data, repeated over several studies over 15 years or so, 8 to 11 percent mortality rate, which, which is too high. What are, the, what are your very best producers doing for pre-weaning mortality rate? What do you think is achievable on your very best farms? 2 percent? 1 percent? Yeah, yeah. On our very best farms, they, they can get it down around 1 percent or even, even less. So, so if this is the industry average, we've got a huge opportunity, at least in the U.S., um, to, to pull up our socks. And I know Canada is very similar. Post-weaning mortality rates, roughly 2 percent. Um, you know, and then hopefully we lose very few on the way up to springing. Now, what are the diseases causing 
these deaths, as you all know, prior to weaning, that's in the blue bar here, prior to weaning, it's usually scours, that's the major culprit, or respiratory disease. Uh, and then we've got miscellaneous things like joint ill and navel ill and so forth. Post weaning, and that's in the purple bars, uh, the major culprit is respiratory disease. So these are our big challenges. And if we tackle scours and pneumonia, by default, we're going to prevent most of these other problems along the way. Why should we care about this calf hood disease? Our producers are well aware of the short-term costs and losses associated with the sick calf. That being the, the extra labor you have to put into nursing that calf, drugs, veterinary fees, and if the calf doesn't make it, there's the, the cost of replacing that animal if it dies. But it isn't simply a question of getting that calf through to weaning and then you're in the free and clear. There are long-term consequences to disease, even if this calf recovers from scours, um, particularly pneumonia. There are big long-term costs associated with that disease event. So animals that recover from a disease event, scours or pneumonia, um, especially pneumonia, we have depressed rate of gain, at least for the next six months. We've got increased risk of, of death before calving, increased risk of culling before calving. And um, with the delayed rate of gain, there's delayed age at breeding and therefore increased age at first calving, which is of course very costly to the producer as well. So the producers need to understand there are long-term costs to disease, not just the upfront short-term costs that we all see. So we do want to do our best to prevent these. All right, this is a, a, a slide, this is just a table of what I think our targets for health and our targets for rate of gain should be in our baby calves. And, and if we can hit these targets all the way through, I think we're well on our way to getting to that goal of breeding her at 13 to 15 months, calving her in at 22 to 24 months, well-developed animal, minimal problems at calving and so forth. Um, this data, or th these goals rather, uh, come from the Dairy Calf and Heifer Association which is a national organization in the United States. Um, they welcome international members as well, I'm sure. Um, this, was, this group was started at least 15 years ago by a group of uh, professional heifer growers who recognized that they were, they were trying to do something and they, and they just didn't know a lot or they, or they had a lot of questions and they didn't know where to go for answers. They wanted to learn and wanted to get better. So they set up this organization and they have an annual meeting, a, a CE meeting that moves around the states and uh, a couple of years ago now, they decided to come up with some gold standards. What should be our targets for health? What should be our targets for gain and for breeding? And th there's a lot of other things that they've come up with. Um, and so they pulled the industry and nutritionists and veterinarians and, and supposed experts in calf management, and they came up with these goals. And I don't think these are outrageous goals. Um, what we have here, I'm sorry that's a little faint maybe, but between birth and 60 days of age, so that's the, the pre-weaning period, then we have 60 to 120 days of age, so that's the first two months post-weaning, and then 121 up to six months of age. Um, so these are the goals for mortality. Uh, Pre-weaning, less than 5%. And as you said, our, our very best herds can get down to 2%, 1%. So I think this 5% goal is a reasonable target for, for people to shoot for. Post weaning, less than 2%. Um, and scours rate, pneumonia rate, uh, pre weaning, less than 25%. Uh, pneumonia rate, less than 10%. And yes, as I mentioned before, we typically see a little bit more pneumonia post weaning, so a goal of less than 15% there. So I think these are reasonable goals. They're not overly ambitious. I think this is something that we could you know, your veterinarian and producers and consultants can work together, establish your, see where you are your, on your farm and establish your own goals and see if you can't um, shoot for that. And then the other goal, so that's goals for health. Uh, another goal is for rate of gain or rate of growth. Um, and Mike Van Amberg and Jim Drakeley and others have done some excellent work. I hope you got a chance to listen to Mike earlier this week. But they've shown that if we can step up the plane of nutrition in the pre-weaning period, by feeding more milk, we can get not just short-term improvements in rate of gain and health, but we can get long-term paybacks in terms of earlier age at first calving and increased milk production in the first lactation. So rather than feeding the traditional one pound of dry matter, you know, a gallon of milk a day, which is roughly 10% of birth weight, uh, we're now trying to promote and trying to get the message out, we want to be feeding at least 20% of body weight to our calves, if not more, in, in, in milk, which equates to about at least two pounds of dry matter if you're feeding a milk replacer uh, formula or roughly two gallons or eight liters of milk per day. And if we can step that up, we can easily double the birth weight of the calf by weaning 
and we can capture these long-term benefits like reduced age at first calving and roughly 1,500 to 1,700 pounds more milk in the first lactation. And many studies have repeatedly shown this. And again, if, if any of you are working with uh, uh, programs where you have stepped up your, your milk feeding rate to 8 liters, 10 liters, some are even above that, you'll know that this uh, goal of doubling the birth weight is easily achievable. It's, it's genetically, our calves are capable of much, much more than that. Um, if we convert this to an average daily gain, um, it, it equates to roughly 1.6 to 1.8 pounds per day average daily gain or 0.7 kilos per day average daily gain, which is roughly double what we've historically done, but certainly it's not ambitious compared to what the calf can genetically do. So that's, that's the goal for feeding, and then we'd like to maintain roughly two pounds of average daily gain post-weaning and on up through, and if we can do that, we can achieve the puberty at a younger age, get them bred, and have them coming in earlier. So these are the goals that I'm shooting for in order to achieve those long-term goals for that springing animal, springing heifer. Now how do we get there? How do we get to these goals of gain and health? So here's where it comes down to what will our calf management program look like in our young stock program. And there are many different areas, components of a young stock program, and you need to address each of these individually, take a look at your program, come up with a plan, protocols, implement it, monitor it, and so forth. Um, starting with, you know, what happens in the maternity pen, care of the newborn, nutrition, housing, sanitation, and so forth. But colostrum, like I mentioned, is one of the, the the legs on the three-legged stool. If we don't have colostrum in place, um, everything else gets very, very wobbly and we're not likely to be able to get good performance overall. So that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. And this is a very big topic and, and I'm giving you a very general overview in, in, in an hour. Um, if I touch on topics that you would like more information about, please email me and I'd be happy to provide you with more detail on anything in particular. Or you know, put up your hand, ask a question, that's fine. All right, so why is colostrum important? So I know all of you know that the calf is born without any circulating protective antibodies to ward off disease, and so it's very important that, that they absorb the antibodies out of colostrum across the gut into the circulation shortly after birth, and then that provides the short-term protection for the first days and weeks and even months while the calf is kicking up, gearing up its own acquired immune system, producing its own antibodies. And without these protective uh, maternal antibodies, passive absorption of the, the mother's antibodies, we can have issues. But, so, so we're all aware of that. However, there are a lot of other components and a lot of other goodies packed into colostrum that are probably feeding into the improved health that we see when calves get good colostrum. A lot of um, nonspecific immune factors, hormones, antibacterial factors in there, well, the nutrients and growth factors that are packed in there at roughly double the concentration, if not more, as compared to regular whole milk, saleable milk. So colostrum is not just about the antibodies and the immunoglobulins, it's about the, the whole package. If the calf gets enough colostrum early enough, it absorbs enough antibodies, we can measure that. We call that successful passive transfer as opposed to failure of passive transfer. If we measure a serum IgG concentration, this is one of the predominant immunoglobulins, IgG, um, somewhere between 24 and 72 hours of age, you, your veterinarian can bleed the calf and you can send a sample off to the lab and get the serum IgG analysis done. And our goal, our minimum goal is to have an IgG of 10 milligrams per mil or higher. If, if it's below that, we call that failure. The truth is that higher would be better yet, but this is the, the minimum for adequate passive transfer. Now, that costs a lot of money to send the sample off to the lab, and there's a delay in time, turnaround time, so I'm going to talk about monitoring later, but on farm, we, we frequently use serum total proteins as a cheap, rapid, uh, indirect method of estimating uh, passive transfer in the group, and I will come back to that. If you might ask, what are the failure of passive transfer rates in our industry? I honestly don't know what they would be for the UK. Um, maybe you have some statistics that you can share with me. But in the US and in Canada, according to the recent studies, this, um, this is the last USDA study that was done, and they're doing another one this year. Um, they, they survey f farms from around the, the nation. They bleed over 2,000 heifer calves and test them. And according to the last study, one in five heifers had failure of passive transfer in the US, one in five. And um, we don't have 
national statistics for Canada. This is an Ontario study done a few years ago. They had basically, well, identical failure rates. So there's an opportunity here. If one in five heifer calves is failing, there's a big opportunity. Um, is anybody here monitoring passive transfer rates in their herd or herds? What are your very best herds getting? Do you know? Mm -hmm. 20% failure rate? Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, and we can talk about what the, what the cut point is that you're using because you may vary your goals based on the cut point that you're using. Um, the, the very best farms that I see are routinely under 10% and often under 5%. Um, so it's achievable. So as an industry, if, you know, if one in five is failing, I, th I think as an industry, we have an opportunity here. <laughs> yes, and when on bigger farms, if different people are feeding the calves and you start to post their numbers, it becomes a little bit of a, a point of pride. It's something like your, your milking shifts, point of pride, exactly. Motivate people, give them, give them some feedback. That, that tells them that this is important to you and they're more apt to continue whatever behaviors or protocols you're after, exactly. Um, this failure of passive transfer rate, uh, this is 1996, so this is getting old now, but Dr. Scott Wells, whom I work with at the University of Minnesota, he estimated that roughly one in three deaths can be attributed to failure of passive transfer. Or, looked at another way, if we could improve our colostrum management, we could prevent the you know, one in three deaths that we see in the very young calves. So bottom line is there's a big opportunity here. All right. so. Why should we care? Um, again, all of you know that if calves have failure of passive transfer, we're more likely to see disease, we're more likely to see mortality, particularly early on. And this is just one example from many, many different studies that have demonstrated this. This is some USDA data. Um, this is days from birth to weaning. And this is a, a survival curve showing the failure rate, failure being death in this particular example. But we've got two survival curves. This is for calves that had failure of passive transfer. This is for calves that had successful passive transfer. And so 8% of calves died in this group, 4% died in this group. So you know, succeeding or failing is not a death sentence and it's not a guarantee of life. However, you can see that obviously your odds are much better if you've got higher passive transfer rates. And all of our producers understand that. But what they don't always understand is there, again, there are long-term payouts or benefits to doing a good job. So it's not just reduced treatment and mortality and you get the calf through alive until weaning. Again, without the disease, we can see improved rate of gain, improved feed efficiency, therefore decreased age at first calving, and even a couple of studies have, have suggested improved milk production of the first and second lactation. And that makes sense. If we don't fry their lungs with a bout of pneumonia early in life, they're, they're going to be better doers throughout. So if we're trying to motivate producers to spend an extra five minutes with the calf doing a good job early on in life, there are big paybacks to be captured, not just in the short term, but in the long term. So it's a little thing. It's a relatively little thing for a big reward. All right, so assuming we all agree that colostrum is important and we want to go out and evaluate the colostrum program on our dairies, a given dairy, this is, these are the areas that we need to investigate. The, the three Q's, probably many of you heard, have heard of the three Q's of, of colostrum management, quality, quantity, and quickness, and those were established, I don't know, a couple of decades ago at least. And I just, I wanna just quickly recap those and give you any new updates in those areas. One area that's relatively new to the conversation is the cleanliness or level of bacterial contamination in colostrum, and we've recognized that that is important as well. And then finally, and as with anything else in, on our farms, nutrition or comfort or anything else, we need ha to have a way to monitor the program. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So we have to have ways of monitoring the program to make sure that it's working. And if it's not, back up and investigate these areas and see what needs to be tweaked. So I'm just gonna go through each of these. And again, if you have questions along the way, please raise your hand. So the first cue is quality. 
the quality of the colostrum being fed. And like I mentioned, there are a lot of goodies packed <coughs> in the colostrum that we, we know they're there, but we typically ignore. We don't test all of the time. What we typically test is the IgG concentration in colostrum, that being the predominant antibody fraction. And what we know is that the higher the IgG levels in the colostrum, this is, this is colostrum IgG concentrations in roughly 220 fractions of colostrum from 220 cows. Um, this is the serum IgG level that was achieved in the calf that was fed whatever particular batch of colostrum. And so it it's, makes sense to everybody. The higher the IgG concentration, the higher the serum IgG is in the calves. You feed them more total grams of IgG, they absorb more total grams of IgG. Nobody in this room should be surprised at this positive relationship. However, um, Oh yeah, and I should note, the, the experts have decided, oh, well over a decade ago now, that anything greater than 50 grams per liter of IgG is considered high quality colostrum. So that's what we should be shooting for. Um, so there's this positive relationship. We want to feed higher quality colostrum. To me, the interesting thing in this graph is to look at the variability in the quality of colostrum from these 220 cows. This is from 12 different herds in Minnesota. Um, I want to know, you know, why did these cows do such a lousy job or you know we harvested poor quality colostrum here and we got liquid gold basically from these cows up here what are the factors that affect colostrum quality and of those factors what are the factors that we can manage that we can manipulate so that we can get more of this stuff so the literature has published many many different factors affecting quality age breed you know some things that are out of our control but there are a number of things that are, that are in our control um, that you want to be looking at on your dairies. Uh, the first I've got listed here is the dry cow vaccination program. Is anyone here giving dry cows a vaccine not to benefit the cow, but rather to benefit the colostrum or the calf? Okay, we've got some hands here. So what types of vaccines, what pathogens are you targeting? Rotavirus and E. coli. Okay, rotavirus, E. coli, any others? Any? Yeah, coronavirus, uh, yeah. So there's several different commercial vaccines available. And th these are the viruses and the common bacteria that cause scours, which is the big killer in calves. So if we can vaccinate the dry cow, the dry heifer, she produces the antibodies, she concentrates those in the colostrum, that's a very effective and cheap way to bump up antigen-specific protection to those calves. And to me, us using one of those types of products should be a routine in everybody's core vaccine program. All right, another one is to feed a balanced dry cow ration, and it's not just a question of the, the, the specs, the nutrient specs on the piece of paper, but are we mixing it? Are we delivering it consistently? Uh, is it available? Is there fresh water available? You know, no overcrowding. Can the cows actually eat it? And I know you've, you've heard lots of good speakers this week talk about those types of, of uh, items or issues. We want to do that to benefit the cow, obviously, but we also will benefit the calf. Um, through, through, well, metabolically and through colostrum. So that's important. Avoiding stressors during the dry period. Um, the production of colostrum is an immune function. It's an immune regulated thing. And so anything that stresses a cow, suppressing the immune system, it'll harm the cow directly. It can also indirectly interfere with colostrum production. Uh, some of the common stressors that we see, don't know about here, but heat stress in the summertime is huge, and we routinely see um, drops in colostrum quality and higher failure of passive transfer rate in the, the you know, late July, early August during our periods of heat stress. Um, but other things like overcrowding, um, maybe frequent transport, frequent mixing, you know, social disruptions, other other stressors could affect us as well. So try to avoid these, not just for the cow's benefit, but also the calf. This is a big one here, avoiding uh, short and long dry periods, but especially a short dry period. Anything under three weeks dry, and she will produce relatively little colostrum and poor quality. She just doesn't have the time to, to make it. It takes about five weeks from start to finish to initiate and produce everything and put it in the gland. So if she doesn't have five weeks, things will start to suffer. And if this, this animal, you know, maybe it's a, a bull-bred animal and we got our breeding dates wrong, so we didn't get her into the dry cow group early enough, or maybe it's somebody carrying twins that we didn't recognize and, and you know, she could have skipped. She could have been dried off a couple of weeks earlier. So if we can avoid this, this will be helpful. And then this last point I put up here, because we've known about it for a long, long time, but I see producers routinely 
missing this opportunity. It has to do with how long you wait from when she calves to when you milk her out, when you harvest that colostrum. And I'll just show you, a, a, this is one of several studies that have demonstrated that the longer you wait, the poorer the quality of colostrum that you will harvest from that gland. This, in this particular study, they milked out quarters at two hours, six hours, 10 hours, or 14 hours plus calving. And relative to the two hour, if that's your baseline, you can see how the concentration of IgG progressively drops the longer we wait. And that's probably due to a, a dilution effect. She's no longer putting IgG into the gland, but she's expanding volume in the gland, and that's causing a dilution effect. So what we want to do, ideally, to get the best stuff, would be to milk that cow within one to two hours post-calving. And for our bigger herds that have got you know, access to a bucket milker, they can put the cow through the parlor quickly, that is easily achievable. For smaller or medium-sized herds that don't have round-the-clock labor, you know, uh, probably if they could shoot for six hours, if they could get most cows milked within six hours of calving, I think you'd be doing a pretty decent job. But small herds or large herds, there, there, there are excuses coming up why we can't milk her as quickly as you'd like. Um, I, we want to shorten that up as much as we can because it really is a lost opportunity on many herds. So that's my list of, of things that you could go back and evaluate. See, Would you be able to dry off have any effect? It would take a couple of weeks for that milk that you've dried up to disappear. Or mm -hmm. Does that have any effect on quality? Um, the question is, does the yield at dry off affect quality at calving? Um, not directly, uh, particularly if she has a sufficient dry period. Um, our dry periods are 55, 60 days on average. Most herds are 45 days or more as their target dry period. Is it similar here? Okay. So assuming she has a sufficiently long dry period, the udder should involute completely, and then she'll have time to come back out of that again. It shouldn't be a problem. There, there's a thought, although I think it's been mostly debunked, that high-producing cows, so this is the indirect thing, high-producing cows produce poor quality colostrum. There's this dogma floating around 10 years ago in the U.S. at least that it's called the 18 pound rule. If a cow produces more than 18 pounds of colostrum at first milking, it must be poor, you should just pour it down the drain, it's crap. Um, and some work at Cornell and a couple of other places has shown that that relationship is actually really, really weak. Um, you cannot say, that, you know, if a cow makes uh, two liters of colostrum or she makes six liters of colostrum, you can't look at the volume and decide it's good or bad quality. You could be wrong every time or you know half of the time. So, so that might indirectly relate to your high producing cow, but indirectly. How do we decide that we've got high or low quality colostrum? Um, we have a couple of on-farm tests available. Again, in, in, in studies, we would send frozen colostrum off to a lab and we would wait for a couple of weeks and pay big dollars to get the IgG concentration. But we do have rapid, quick, sheep on-farm tests that we can do to monitor this if we choose. Now, are you all familiar with this old glass thing here, the old colostrometer? Okay, um, it's collecting dust on a lot of shelves, on a lot of farms. It, doesn't, it really never got widely adopted. Uh, vet students are really good at breaking this instrument. Um, it's cheap, it's like $40, but it's not perfectly accurate. It tends to under, under, sorry, overestimate the quality of colostrum. It's temperature dependent. So it's been around forever, but it really never got widely adopted. Now this instrument here, um, this is called the BRICS refractometer. This is a, a handheld BRICS that you hold up to the light. Um, it looks just like the serum total protein refractometer that you might be using, but if you look at the scale, it's a different scale. It's a BRICS scale, and the units reported are percentage, BRICS percent. And it's actually measuring sugars, and people who are into beer making or wine making or honey making, um, we'll use this instrument to look at sugar concentration. Well, it turns out concentration of, of the sugars are, are directly or positively associated with IgG. It's also positively associated with uh, total solids in milk. Uh, it's also positively associated with serum total proteins. It turns out this instrument can be used for a number of different purposes on the farm. This is the optical, handheld, maybe $100, $110. This is a digital refractometer. That's about $300. It just, it's more fun because you put the drop of milk on it, and it goes boop, and you get your answer really quickly. So people like that. But either, either way, um, it turns out through several studies that on the brick scale, 22% uh, on the brick scale predicts about 50 grams per liter of IgG or better. So and it, 
it is more accurate and probably a little bit tougher in the barn, stand up better in the barn than the old colostrometer. So since this was validated a few years ago, we have seen increased adoption and, and, and more people measuring colostrum quality as a routine on their farms. So that's quality. Um, so we want to feed high quality colostrum and there are many things we can do to manipulate that. Are there any questions about that before we move on to another cue? Okay, next cue, quantity, volume. What should we provide at first feeding? Um, the old thoughts, if you read the older textbooks, say that we have to get 100 grams of IgG into that calf in order to get 10 milligrams per mil in the blood. What the books didn't say is that's for the average calf. So if I want my average calf, the middle calf on the bell curve, to just get to 10 milligrams per mil, I will, I will feed every calf 100 grams of IgG. But if I do that, half my calves fail, right? And I, I said I want 90% of my calves at least to pass. So it turns out if I want 90% of my calves above the 10 milligram per mil uh, serum IgG, I actually need to feed 150 to 200 grams of IgG to all calves and then usually 90% or better will pass. So my question for you is what volume should I be feeding of my colostrum if I wanted to, let's say, get 200 grams into the calf? And the answer would be, what's that? Four, Four liters? Yeah. Okay, making the assumption that? <laughs> that you've got 50 grams per liter. Yeah, 50 grams per liter, four liters, I'm good, I'm there. Um, and if you didn't know the, the, the quality, then it's a guess, isn't it? So, but you're, but you're right. Um, it, the answer is it depends on the quality. And historically, at least, most of our farms haven't measured quality, so they really don't know, so we're guessing. And so what we do is we hedge our bets by just feeding a larger volume and hope that it's 50 grams per liter or higher. And if it is, we should be in good shape. So, um, so what it comes down to, at least currently, is this recommendation that we feed 10% of birth weight um, in the first feeding, or at least within the first six hours. And that, depending on the quality, that's going to be three to four liters. And, and most, well, most of our larger dairies, at least, um, in the U.S. Are, in Canada are feeding four liters at the first feeding, or at least within the first six hours. So that's where that came from. If we've got reasonable quality colostrum, we get that in, then we should be getting our 150 to 200 gram target. And this is just a little bit of, you know, this is just one of many studies that said, okay, if we feed two liters at birth or if we feed four liters at birth, obviously the calves that got the four liters get more total grams, their serum IgGs will be higher. That's just math. So calves read the textbook and they do math. That's fine. Um, I guess I should ask, am I gonna get to it? Oh yeah, I'm gonna to get to it later as to the method of feeding. The third cue is quickness. How fast do we need to get the colostrum into the calf? And I know you're probably all aware of this gut closure phenomena that happens in a calf. So it's born with an open gut that will non-specifically absorb these large protein molecules, uh, these IgGs. Uh, and, uh, I should mention it will also absorb bacteria, so it's a period of risk as well. But over the first 24 hours, the efficiency of absorption, the ability of that gut to absorb diminishes, and by roughly 24 hours, it's closed. We've lost our window of opportunity. So our goal should be to feed ideally within one to two hours when efficiency of absorption is at its highest. And if, if everybody could, again, shoot for a six hour target, you know, even in smaller herds, you come in first thing in the morning, the calf is on the ground, try to get everybody fed within six hours, and you'll be doing reasonably well. So that's quality, quantity, quickness. So options for quick colostrum feeding on real farms. Um, so here's the scenario, at least in Canada, the hockey game just ended. You go out to the barn to check the cows and there's a wet calf on the ground and the veterinarian was just there nagging or I was just there you know, talking at a meeting last week about the importance of feeding it quickly. What is the best option for getting colostrum quickly into this calf? What would be the ideal thing that you're gonna do next? milk the cow and feed the calf, right? Bite the bullet, milk the cow and get the high quality colostrum out and turn around and feed the calf. Now, then we will have producers that say, well, the parlor's not available or she doesn't have colostrum or I don't feel like it. So what are the backup plans for getting colostrum into? Frozen, 
stored, yeah, refrigerated, frozen. So, yeah, there are a number of options. The best would be milk the cow, feed the calf, but you may have refrigerated colostrum, you may have frozen colostrum, or you may have a few bags of a powdered colostrum replacer sitting on the shelf, which I think is a smart thing for any dairy to have. And so any of these, well, at least one of these can be made to work for all dairies, Indi regardless of your size, small dairy, large dairy, it really doesn't matter. So, all right. Then we come to the question of how are we going to get the four liters into the calf? What will be the method of feeding the calf? The options here are leaving the calf to suckle the dam, nipple bottle, or esophageal tube feeder. By the way, that head is cranked up way too high in this picture. You want to have it in a more neutral position when you're passing that tube. Um, the reason I bring this up is that your choice in what method of feeding could affect the cues, the quality, the quantity, the quickness, and the cleanliness. So if you had to pick one of these to cross off the list, what is the least desirable? The first one, right. Yeah, studies have demonstrated, several studies have demonstrated that on farms where they leave the calf to nurse the dam, those farms routinely have the highest failure rates. And there are several reasons for this. This is just one study that demonstrates this. Uh, in calves born to first calf heifers or in calves born to older cows, second lactation or greater, this was the proportion of calves left with the dam that had not suckled yet within six hours of birth. 11% of calves born to heifers, almost half of the calves born to an older cow had not suckled by six hours of age. So timing, you know, the quickness, that's being delayed. So that's one factor. Other factors that may be contributing to failure past the transfers, once the calf does get up to nurse, we don't know or we can't control the volume that it's consuming. And finally, while that calf is in that environment, it's exposed to pathogens in, in contaminated manure, it's eating little manure meals off the hide, off the teeth skin, so there's concerns about pathogen exposure as well. So this would be my least um, desirable method of feeding the calf. After that, we're down to a choice of either nipple bottle or esophageal tube feeder. So, so who here are nipple bottle people? Who feel strongly about, okay, a few. Who, who here likes to use an esophageal tube feeder? Okay, a few more. And who here doesn't care, could, thinks either one could work fine? Okay, and a few more. Yeah, the, the research is saying, and there, there are a few studies now, that say it doesn't matter. Take your pick, just get the volume in. Get the volume in quickly and it really doesn't matter. And I'm going to show you one, one of the most recent studies that demonstrate this. This particular study, they took 26 newborn calves and they paired them up, so thir 13 pairs of two. Uh, one of the, each pair was going to be fed with a nipple bottle, the second was going to be fed with the tube feeder. So the bottle fed calf was fed first and they let it nurse for 20 minutes and they recorded how much it drank in 20 minutes. And then when the next calf, the paired calf was born, that was tube fed and it was tube fed the same volume. So they controlled the timing, they controlled the volume, the only thing that was different was um, method of feeding, bottle or tube. And then they bled the calves at 48 hours to measure their serum IgGs. So what we have here, I know you probably can't see that, That's, this is the bottle group, this is the tube group, and this is a p-value that just indicates whether there was a significant difference or not. And if the p is less than 0.05, we say, yeah, there was a difference. So right away you can see no difference between these groups. What we have here, first of all, is the volume consumed. So on average, the bottle-fed calves drank 2.2 liters in 20 minutes. Not enough, right? Um, that ranged from one to four. So you can see some calves will drink as little as one liter, other calves will drink as much as four liters. That's great for the four liter calf, but on average they really didn't do enough. And so the tube fed, of course, was balanced. So they, you know, that's the same. Serum IgG at 48 hours of age, six, averaging 6.6 .6 or 7.3 milligrams per mil of IgG in the blood. So no difference there. And if you look at the proportion of calves in each group with failure of passive transfer, meaning a serum IgG less than 10 milligrams per mil, 85% failed in both groups. So the first conclusion is bottle equals tube. There was no difference. The second conclusion should, should be two liters didn't cut it. You know, we just have way too high failure rates. So we really need to be getting up to the, you know, the three and the four liters um, to get where we want to get. And how you get there, bottle or tube, I really don't care. As long as you're trained, you know what you're doing, how to do it safely, using clean equipment and so forth, I don't care. It comes down to time, doesn't it? It does. It comes down. 
Yeah, it comes down to time is the comment here, and that's, that's exactly right. And so on the bigger dairies where they've got a lot, of do, a lot to do, they just want to tube it and move on with their other tasks of the day. Maybe on smaller dairies, they, they want to use a bottle, and that's totally fine. However, if, if you've got the average calf that only drinks two liters, then what do you need to be prepared to do? With a, either take the residual that it didn't drink, put it in a tube and tube it, or you need to be prepared to come back in a couple more hours, at least before six hours, and give it a, offer it a second feeding. Yeah, so if you're prepared to do that, great. I, you know, I'm not gonna worry either way. Just the feeding method doesn't matter. Getting it in quickly, getting enough in quickly, that's what's important. All right, cleanliness. Moving on to cleanliness now. So quality, quantity, quickness, cleanliness. Here we're talking about contamination with bacteria, although I suppose viruses could be a concern as well. The two major concerns with feeding dirty, contaminated colostrum are, first of all, if the, path, if the bacteria in the colostrum happen to be pathogenic bacteria, meaning that they can cause disease, then obviously we don't want to feed that to calves. And uh, you know, our, our list of usual suspects could include E. coli, salmonella, mycoplasma, um, yonis or MAP. You know, any, any number of things could be contaminating the colostrum to cause disease. The other um, concern is that it turns out, we've learned this, well, Bob James actually remarked on this in 1980, and then it was ignored or forgotten, but you know, everything takes a 20 year cycle and then we rediscover it, right? Um, so 20 years later, we noticed that bacterial levels in colostrum, the higher the bacteria, it seems to interfere or somehow block absorption of IgG. We don't know the mechanism, we can speculate as to how that happens, but in several studies repeatedly over the last five or six years, we've seen this relationship. This is a scatter plot with over 1,000 calves, and on the x-axis, we've got the coliform count, coliform bacteria in the colostrum, and this is a, in a log score, so there's 10, 100 CFUs per mil, 1,000 CFUs per mil, a log score of six would be 1 million CFUs per mil. Um, and here's the serum IgG concentration in the calf that was fed that particular aliquot of colostrum. And while there's a pile of scatter in the scatter plot, there is a significant negative relationship. So calves that are fed very, very clean colostrum on average were at about 18 milligrams per mil IgG. Calves that got the really polluted stuff, you know, a million CFUs per mil or greater, they're down in around, well, less than 15. This, so this significant negative relationship has come up again and again in our research. So that bacterial interference could be contributing to failure of passive transfer, could be you know, a concern. So, um, get my little clicker to work here. What should our goals be for cleanliness? Um, Sheila McGurk out of Wisconsin has established these goals and I think they're very reasonable. Um, if you were to take a colostrum sample, put it in a little mastitis sample vial, freeze it, send it off to your local mastitis lab to have it cultured, I, I simply ask for a total plate count, just a standard plate count that should be less than 100,000 CFUs per mil, or if you ask for total coliforms, it should be less than 10,000 CFUs per mil. And uh, I've seen a lot of polluted colostrum well above that in, in our research. Um, how often do producers feed contaminated colostrum? Again, if those are our goals coming from Sheila or Sam Ledley in, in New York, he's been a big advocate for cleaning up our colostrum. Um, most recently, there was a study done in several regions around the United States, dairy regions. They collected, there were samples from 67 herds, uh, four different regions. Over 800 colostrum samples were tested cultured, and 43% of those exceeded the 100,000 cut point. So again, a lot of dirty colostrum being fed. So there's an opportunity there to clean it up. So once we've decided that we have dirty colostrum, let's say you do do some culturing, you say, ah, oh, things are dirtier than we'd like, then the obvious question is, well, where is it coming from, and then how do we intervene? So I've got a list of three different places or sources where this these bacteria could be arriving from, and you, you would need to investigate each of these. The first is from the cow, um, either from shed from an infected gland or from fecal contamination of the teeth skin, um, and that gets washed into the colostrum. The second source could be from dirty equipment, contaminated equipment that's used for milking or storing or feeding the colostrum. And the third source could be from bacterial growth or proliferation in stored colostrum. So I want to just go through each of these and identify places, uh, 
actions or management strategies you could adopt to prevent um, bacteria arriving from any of these sources. So first of all, coming from the cow, how do we avoid that? Um, if you knew cows were subclinically infected with mycoplasma or yonis or something like that, if you are using yonis testing, let's say, that would be one useful you know, way of using that information is I've got a positive cow, I'm not going to feed her colostrum to a heifer calf. Um, another uh, thing, well, we said don't let the calf suckle the dam. We've already talked about why not, but one reason is if that teat isn't, hasn't been cleaned and sanitized, then the calf will be eating manure off of that teat while it's suckling. Um, when we do milk the cow, we, don't, we, we do want to prep the udder the same way you would for your regular cows so that we're not, again, washing manure into the bucket. And finally, um, we don't want to pool raw colostrum. You've all heard the one cow to one calf rule, I hope. Okay, if a cow is unbeknownst to us shedding mycoplasma in her colostrum, we, we want to feed that just to one calf. We don't want to pool it and then feed that to five calves. We want to minimize our risk. So these are things that, that everybody could be doing. Um, in terms of contaminated equipment, um, again, anything that harvests or stores or feeds the calf, anything the colostrum comes into contact with on the way to the calf, has to be evaluated, and you can use your eyeball test, you can do the fingernail gunge test, um, you can get fancier and do swabs and cultures and things like that if you want to investigate how dirty or clean the equipment is, but um, if, the, if the colostrum is dirty, this is certainly one place you want to be looking at, and if you find there are uh, deficiencies, then you can work with your consultant, veterinarian, producers, they can all work together to identify what, what, what is the protocol for cleaning and sanitizing this equipment, develop a protocol, train the staff to do it, and then monitor the outcome. Now, I just want to show you some data to indicate how much contamination can arrive just from dirty equipment. This is a study we did uh, several years ago now where we took 40 fresh cows. They had just calved within the last hour. They were brought up to a milking um, station where we collect colostrum on this dairy. And what we did was we, we prepped the udder really well, nice and clean the way we normally would. We scrubbed the teat end with alcohol the way you would before collecting a sample for a mastitis culture. So we got an aseptic sample from the teats. Then we put on the milking unit, milked her into the bucket, so we collected a second sample out of the bucket. Then we transferred that into an esophageal tube feeder and collected a third sample out of the end of the tube feeder. And all of this was done within about 30 minutes. All three samples were put in the freezer, sent off to the lab for culture, and then we looked at the total bacteria count. And so we said the goal for total plate count should be less than 100,000 CFUs per mil. That on a log scale, that's a log of five, so we want it to be less than five. So coming out of the cows, the average total plate count was somewhere between 10 and 100 CFUs per mil, very clean stuff. And unless she had mastitis or we contaminated the sample, it should be zero, right? So that's fine. But coming out of the bucket, almost half of our samples were contaminated, meaning the, the counts were over 100,000 CFUs per mil. Now, we didn't see any additional contamination coming out of the tube feeder, so that was good. But you can imagine on some farms, when you look at the bottom of the, the bottle or the nipple or whatever, it, it, you know, this could have been a different story. But the point is, we can see a lot of contamination just arriving from dirty equipment alone. So it's worth you going and looking and seeing how that's going. The last point I'll bring up is bacterial growth or proliferation in stored colostrum. Um, on a warm day, like we've had this week, it's been very, very pleasant, at least for Minnesota standards. Um, if, you, if you harvest the colostrum and you turn around and feed it within one or two hours, the bacteria never really get a chance to start multiplying and growing. But on a warm day, after about two hours, the, the, the data says the E. coli will double roughly every 20 minutes. So you've got about a two hour grace period to feed the calf or make a decision on how you're gonna handle that colostrum. If you're not gonna feed the calf right away, if you are going to store it, then you wanna get it into the refrigerator as quickly as you can or freeze it. Uh, or there's some, um, there's some people using preservatives like potassium sorbate preservatives to get a little bit of extra shelf life out of it. Um, and the question comes up, how long can we refrigerate it? Um, when I was growing up and even, even the last 10 years, the dogma was, oh, I can put it in the fridge for a week at least and it'll be fine. 
Well, that may be true if you're thinking about the stability of the IgGs, but it turns out it's not true if you're thinking about bacterial growth. And I'm just going to show you some data to demonstrate that. So what's the shelf life of fresh colostrum in the freezer? So here's a study we did with days in refrigerator going from 0 to 10. And um, this is, the, the, again, the log of the total plate count in the colostrum. And there's our log score 5 that we don't want to get greater than. That's the 100,000 total plate count. <coughs> so the dark blue line here is the average uh, total plate count in fresh, raw colostrum, which is what most of our producers are feeding. Um, on the first day, it was a little over 10,000 CFUs per mil on average, so on average that was okay. But by two days in, we we're sneaking up to that 100,000 cut point. And by six days in, we're over 1 million CFUs per mil. So if you're just feeding regular raw colostrum, my take home message from that would be, we want to turn this over fairly quickly, ideally within a day or two. And if you start with dirty colostrum you know, at a million, you're already behind the eight ball. But wherever you start, the idea is feed it up, turn it over fairly quickly. Now this uh, pink line here is, is preserved colostrum with potassium sorbate preservative, which most people aren't doing, but some dairies are doing. So you can see that gets you a couple of extra days of shelf life in the refrigerator. And this, these two lines down here, the green and the blue line, that's actually heat treated colostrum in the refrigerator with or without potassium sorbate preservative. And here, so you see we knock the bacteria counts down to about 10 CFUs per mil on average by heat treating. And then if you, assuming you put it in a clean container, the shelf life should be very, very good. It should be what we drink from the supermarket, right? Assuming you put it back into a clean container and your refrigerator is working. So even 10 days later, um, the bacteria are only just starting to <coughs> sneak up. So you've got, if you, were, if you were heat treating your colostrum, you've got a much longer shelf life. But again, most of our producers are feeding fresh raw colostrum. So if they're refrigerating it, the take home message, turn it over fairly quickly. Um, four degrees centigrade. Yeah. Um, or yeah, no. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I think it's four degrees centigrade. Um, 40, 40 Fahrenheit. Yeah. I got it. No. Canada went to the metric system when I was in grade three, and I never really got either system figured out well. All right. Um, so what I've talked about so far, um, preventing contaminated stuff coming from the cow, clean equipment, preventing growth in stored colostrum, that is all motherhood and apple pie stuff that every dairy can be doing and should be doing. Um, the last two things I'm going to talk about here are additional tools that I don't think everybody needs to be worrying about, but there may be places for them on some farms. The first one I'm going to bring up is the use of colostrum replacers or powdered colostrum. Um, now the first thing to note is there are colostrum replacers and there are colostrum supplements. And it's important that our producers know the difference. A replacer must have at least 100 grams of IgG in a bag. It's, it's meant to actually replace to feed instead of colostrum if you had no colostrum. Whereas a supplement will typically have 30 to 60 grams of IgG in a bag. It's meant to supplement, to add up, add into or top up poor quality or an insufficient volume of colostrum. And the, the concern I have is, is replacers are expensive. They're $30, $35 now per dose uh, in US dollars. That's expensive, whereas a supplement might be $6 or $8. Um, I have had producers call up in the middle of January and say, my calves are all dying, and we start the conversation, the questions, what are you feeding? Well, I'm feeding a replacer because I don't want, I want to control yonis. Okay, what, what replacer are you feeding? I don't know. Um, don't remember the name. Okay, what are you paying for your replacer? Six bucks. So, so they're feeding a supplement and don't realize it. So that's a mistake. We just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page and they know what a replacement product is. Now, um, so the IgG, at least in the U.S., the IgG could come from spray-dried colostrum or it could come from uh, plasma or serum. Uh, in Canada, the, the serum products are not allowed. It's only the colostrum products, and I'm not sure what the deal is here in the U.K., but uh, either way, I, I think this, these are convenient. You pull it off the shelf, you mix it up, you feed it. Um, it's consistent, uh, and if you don't have high-quality, clean maternal colostrum, I think you know, every dairy should have a few packages on the shelf. The, the shelf life is at least a year or two 
uh, these dried products um, very handy to have around. Now there are, there are good products and there are poor products. There are products that have done research and have data behind them. There are products that don't. <coughs> so whatever you're thinking about using, ask for the data. And if they can't provide you with data, go to a company that has done the work, does have the research to stand behind their product. Because at least in Canada and the US, there are lots to choose from, um, lots of good ones to choose from that do have good data behind them. Um, but I did say, most of these replacers only have 100, maybe 130 grams in a dose. And we really want to be getting 150 to 200 grams into our calves if we want a high rate of failure, or sorry, of successful passive transfer. Again, if I only feed 100 grams, I can expect about half of my calves to fail and half to pass. And it turns out that's, that's exactly right. The calves read the textbook on this one. This is a study that we, we did in Minnesota. This is the Land O'Lakes colostrum replacer. It's spray dried colostrum. There's 100 grams of IgG in that bag, one dose. And these are three groups of calves, 25 to 30 calves per group, fed either one dose, one and a half doses, or two doses. So that these calves get 100 grams, 150 grams, or 200 grams of IgG. And this is the average serum IgG level in that group. And remember, we want to be at least 10 or higher. In the 100 gram group, they just about but didn't quite make it to the 10 milligram per mil on average. 54% of calves failed. And that's exactly what we predict if we do the math. Um, 150 grams, only 5% of calves failed. 200 grams, no calves failed. And I didn't put the bar here, but if there was another um, group that was fed four quarts of maternal colostrum, and they were equivalent to the 200 gram group, which makes sense if we have 50 gram per liter times 3.8 liters, four quarts, it should be right up where there. So, so the point is that if a producer buys one of these replacer products and feeds one dose, and then you come in and do some serum total protein testing and you have a high failure rate, you might conclude this is a crappy product, let's not use this product anymore, when in fact it could be that you simply didn't feed enough of that product. So it, it's just a question of education and, and our, our producers understanding what they need to do. So if it's a high value heifer, you know, ET, whatever, um, I do want to invest the extra money to get 150 to 200 grams in there. Now it's pricey. Do I have a cost benefit analysis? No, you're gonna have to do your own gut, you know, math on that one. But I just want you to understand this is how the biology works. Okay. Moving on, so that's replacers. Um, yesterday when we were talking about Yoni's disease, I already presented this information. One of the places these replacers is marketed as is as a potential uh, disease control uh, tool. And so we did do this study years ago looking at whether feeding a replacer would control or reduce transmission of Yoni's. And you've already seen this data. This was done in 12 herds, 500 heifer calves, roughly half fed a colostrum <coughs> replacer, the other half fed raw maternal colostrum. We followed them up to adults. We tested them in the first, second, and third lactation with serum ELISA and fecal culture to see if there were differences in infection rates. And in fact, there were. Um, but, so this is, uh, they start calving in here at roughly you know, 24, 27 months of age, something like that. We test them in the first, second, and third lactation. By the end of the third lactation or the third test, 12% of the group fed maternal colostrum had tested positive for Yoni's. Only 8% of the group that had been fed the replacer had tested positive for Yoni's. So it seems that it could be a tool um, if you wanted to be really aggressive in your Yoni's control program. T two minutes? Oh dear. Okay. Um, the other additional tool, and again, this is not for everybody, but we have some bigger herds adopting this, um, is heat treating colostrum. And I did, I can probably go through this fairly quickly because we did talk about this yesterday with the Yoni's study, but we've learned that if we heat treat colostrum at 60 degrees centigrade for 60 minutes, then we can either refrigerate it or freeze it, and then we can thaw it, warm it, and feed it to a calf. Um, we do see some uh, biologic benefits. Um, and just so you know, that 60 degrees centigrade for 60 minute protocol is, is very specific. If you get above 61.5 centigrade, you will start to cook or denature the IgGs. And if, this is what colostrum looks like if you run it at traditional <coughs> pasteurization temperatures that we might be using for our waste milk, um, pudding, and you can't feed that to a calf. And if you do feed it to a calf, they've got less IgGs, so that doesn't work. But inoculation, in inoculation studies in the lab, the 60-60, 
uh, protocol did a nice job of reducing or eliminating yoni, salmonella, mycoplasma, E. coli. And like I showed you yesterday, I'm going to skip through this really quickly because I know you've seen it before. Um, we did this controlled field trial, six herds, 500 calves per group, half fed uh, fresh colostrum, half fed, fed heat treated colostrum. Um, we looked at passive transfer, we looked at health of the calves. Um, we, we were able to reduce bacteria counts in the heat treated colostrum. We were able to maintain the IgG concentrated concentration in the heat treated colostrum. We actually saw improved IgG levels in the calves fed the heat treated colostrum, we think, because there's less bacterial interference. There was cleaner colostrum fed. And we saw significantly less scours and less disease overall in the calves fed the heat treated colostrum. Now, is that economically? You know, what's the cost benefit? I haven't crunched the numbers, but, but enough herds are impressed with this reduced treatment rate that they're adopting it. Um, now, moving on. Oh yeah, one more other little thing on heat treating. The big herds are going to use a batch pasteurizer. Um, they're going to put the colostrum in the batch pasteurizer, but you need, you know, depending on the size of the batch, two or three or four gallon minimum batch size to run a batch. So if you're on a small dairy or a even a medium-sized dairy and you've only got one cow calving on a day and she's only giving one gallon, it's not practical. You can't wait for three days to save up enough colostrum to run a batch. So the solution to this uh, problem, one potential solution, has been development of this, this is a three liter or a four liter disposable bag. It's a Teflon type bag. Um, this is coming, this is called the Perfect Udder System from Dairy Tech out of Colorado, out of the US, and I think they have, they are selling marketing pasteurizers in the UK now, so I think you would have access to this as well. But the idea here is that you would take the one cow, one gallon of colostrum that she just produced, put it in the bag, and then you can actually float it. So if you have a batch pasteurizer that you're using for your milk, you're going to pay for the pasteurizer with the waste milk um, program. You could take the bag of colostrum and float it in the milk or in, in water for that matter at the 60-60 protocol and it bobs around and jostles around for an hour and that provides enough agitation. And we, we evaluated this as Andy Kreiser, he's a vet student, uh, he's a senior student now, he two summers ago evaluated the perfect udder system as compared to the batch system or as compared to fresh colostrum and he saw exactly the same outcomes in the perfect udder bag as he did in the batch. So for small or medium sized dairies that own a batch pasteurizer for the purposes of treating the milk, pasteurizing milk, and you, if you wanted to play with or experiment with heat treating colostrum, this would be a, you know, buy a few bags and try it out. Um, just remember you need the 60-60 protocol for the colostrum. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip, well, so very quickly, again, heat treating colostrum is a new thing. Not everybody's doing it yet. It's catching on with bigger herds. I'm not strongly promoting it. It's just one of these additional tools that could be valuable to some dairies. If you do try it, though, here's my kind of do's and don'ts list. If you do want to try it, use either a batch pasteurizer or the perfect udder system. Those have been validated. Um, there is a UV treatment. Uh, GIA is marketing UV pasteurizers in the US, and I think they're making their way over this side of the pond now. Uh, it turns out that UV treatment of colostrum is a bad idea. Two studies have reported a 43% or a 50% reduction in IgG with UV treatment. Um, they don't know why, it's just bad. So don't do that. Um, if you are treating, heat treating colostrum, we do need constant agitation. We need rapid active heating and rapid active cooling. Uh, we do want to monitor the temperatures. Like I said, we don't want to get temperature fluctuations above 61 or 61 and a half or things will go south. Um, and then at the end of the day, we want to monitor bacteria counts in colostrum to make sure that it is coming out clean and passive transfer rates and health in the calves. All right, so that's the thing on cleanliness. Uh, several things that everybody can be doing, a couple of additional tools like replacers or heat treatments that some farms, you know, might be useful to some farms. So quality, quantity, quickness, cleanliness. I know I'm over time now. If you'll forgive me, I want two more minutes. Thank you. Um, last thing is monitoring. So we've implemented all of this. We hope we do a good job. Let's go measure it. Or maybe the calves aren't doing so well and we want to troubleshoot <coughs> a problem. How are we going to measure that? Um, we're going to come back to measuring passive transfer rates in the calves. So like I said, you collect a, a serum sample between 24, and 48 or 72 hours of age, even up to a week is fine. 
You could send it off to a lab, a reference lab, and get serum IgGs, but that's expensive, and we can't, you know, ongoing monitoring, we don't want to do that. But it turns out, if we look at serum total protein, oh, now there's a couple papers using the BRICS. Actually, you could use the BRICS refractometer. Um, there's a positive relationship between IgG and serum total protein in the first week of life. After a week, this relationship goes out the window because the calf is now producing its own antibodies and that kind of muddies the picture. So if you're going to do this, do it between one day and one week of age. And, oh dear, um, it turns out the cut point to, to predict a 10 milligram per mil IgG is roughly 5.0 or 5.2 on the serum total protein scale. So I'm currently using a 5.2 as my goal. So what you want to do is go out and bleed a group of calves, um, 12 or more clinically normal calves. So for smaller herds, you may need to do this over successive, you know, a few weeks in order to get enough. They need to be between one and seven days of age. Clinically normal, so don't pick the scouring, dehydrated looking calf because it will give you a false reading. Um, let the blood clot or spin it down. You can actually let it clot in the fridge overnight and just get the serum off the top of the clot. That works equally well. Um, and your, or your veterinarian can do this. And then the goal is, uh, my goal is 90% or more of the calves tested should be at or above a 5.2 total protein. Uh, Sheila McGurk suggests that 80% of calves should be at or above a 5.5. Either way, the, the whole point is to say our program is working, good, pat on the back, let's check again next month, or our program is broken, oops, we better back up and investigate the three cues and cleanliness and see what we can tweak. And um, higher is better. So, so these goals are basically our minimums for deciding if our program is working. Um, if you can get total proteins at six, 6.5, yay, good for you, that's, that's well done. All right, so that's the overview of colostrum management. High quality, good enough volume, as fast as we can, make it clean, make sure that we can monitor to make sure the outcomes are what we want. And if we can do all of that, um, hopefully, again, that's one leg and the three-legged stool towards having a successful calf program. And um, if, again, if anybody has specific questions, wants more detail on anything I've talked about today, please just get in touch. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and um, thank you, Michael, for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Sandra. Um, it's lovely to have your time here this week, but are there questions for Sandra? Uh, just before we close the meeting, before I know, yeah, please. Uh, just a quick question on duration of um, colostrum feeding ah. beyond the yeah. first dose. Great. Before. So the question was um, beyond the first dose, um, is, there, is there any benefit to free, you know, more feedings later on? And I didn't touch on that, and I really should. Um, that's an excellent point, and 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 it turns out there are um, benefits in some situations. So uh, if a lot of our big farms, they're going to feed four liters using a tube, and that's the last colostrum that calf will see. And after that, they're going to be put on either commercial milk replacer or pasteurized whole milk. And, and they do fine. You know, no problems, good total proteins, good health, and I'm going to leave it at that. But uh, some farmers like to offer a second or third feeding, um, and then there's, there's going to be some marginal benefit to that. You know, the efficiency of absorption later is going to be poorer. But, you know, if you want to do that and you can manage that, um, good for you. Now, post gut closure, it's really interesting. So after 24 hours of age, the gut is closed and we've lost the ability to absorb. The question is, is there any benefit to feeding colostrum after a day of age? And in um, more than a couple of, I can think of two studies now, in, in situations where you might have a nagging endemic rotavirus, coronavirus, crypto, uh, scours issue, at, usually it hits between 7 and 12 days of age. People that are struggling with those, the reason we think that happens is the, um, the colostrum is in the gut for about 5 days, um, and after that it's re-secreted from the blood into the gut, but after about 5 days it's, it's kind of gone, and, and we think that's part of the reason why at 7 days and later the, the, these bugs emerge. There have been a couple of studies now that looked at putting you know, a, couple of a cup of colostrum per milk feeding into the milk, or putting about 10 grams of IgG in a, from a replacer, a supplement product, in the milk for about 14 days out. And what that does is it provides local protection in the gut. So the antibodies are floating down the lumen of the gut and they bump into a virus or crypto, whatever, they neutralize it. 
And it, it doesn't prevent the disease entirely, but it reduces the, the severity and the duration of the scars event. And so it, it's a Band-Aid to, you know, while you're trying to figure out sanitation or nutrition or, you know, why is this happening to my calves, um, feeding a little bit of colostrum for the first 12 to 14 days can provide some additional local benefits, yes. But then, but then again, it comes back to a question of um, how am I going to practically implement this on my farm? So some people can and some people you just want to figure out the source of the problem and fix it. Good question. Thank you. Yes. Just on yeah. the refrigeration time, what about freezing time of colostrum? Too? What's some of the great oh, time? yeah, yeah. How long can we freeze colostrum? I have never seen good data on that. Nobody's looked. Um, the word is that a year, you know, roughly a year sounds good, although I think probably a whole gallon, you could probably keep it in longer. Um, you c the concern is if there are multiple freeze thaws, if you have a self-defrosting refrigerator freezer and it actually thawed several times, there's a concern, although I've never seen the data, that that might damage the IgG. I have actually frozen, thawed, frozen, thawed. So I've done two freeze thaw cycles and not seen a loss of IgG. But that doesn't mean to say, you know, three or four could be a problem. So I'm going to just say a year because that's what they say. Um, I do have little vials of colostrum sitting in the freezer that I come back to four years later and it's dehydrated. It's like obviously crap and that, that needs to go, but larger volumes probably, I'll just say a year. Thank you, Sandra. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for Sandra to, to be here this week. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just, uh,